I did start writing this novel in 1999 and I completed it in 2001. But then uh, just uh, recently during the COVID uh, period, I uh, picked up the manuscript again. I had sort of put it aside all those years. I was hit by this thought that, you know, I am bringing this out. The novel is going to be uh, out there in the in the public sphere. And what if it's really dated? And just then, the incident you have just mentioned, the in, in the the Jarawala, Jarawala incident happened. Hi everyone, my name is Elia Zehra, and joining me today is Tahira Nakwi, who is a writer, translator, uh, and an associate professor at New York University, where she teaches Urdu language and literature. Uh, she has translated uh, the works of several uh, literary giants from Salad Hassan Manto to Ismat Chukhtai and many others. Uh, but today we'll talk about her own book uh, that came out recently. It's a novel called The History Teacher of Lahore. And uh, it is, uh, as the name indicates, it's about a history teacher who is in Lahore. His name is Arif. And uh, he is uh, someone who is very passionate about teaching, but he finds himself uh, uh, in, caught in the middle of a, uh, a system where, where religious intolerance is the norm. So it is a fascinating novel about this very sensitive issue of religious intolerance, extremism, uh, and blasphemy law, blasphemy-related violence in Pakistan. It is set in Lahore uh, of the 1980s, and which was a very um, sort of intense, uh, uh, you know, period in our political history. Although um, there is no period in Pakistan's political history which is not eventful, but that uh, period in particular, it was there was military dictatorship and uh, persecution of religious minorities were uh, was the norm. Uh, the dissidents were hounded by by the military uh, dictatorships uh, uh, and different authorities. So this was a time when. Um, uh, People who were who held alternative views, who were critical in their in their views, were found themselves in a very difficult position. So this history teacher um, sort of uh, tried to uh, fight this injustice. Uh, one of his students uh, gets arrested for blasphemy, and uh, he is someone who is who wants to fight that. But I won't like give a lot of spoilers because I love the book and I could not stop uh, reading it. I did not want it to finish because it's sort of a very sensitive subject and it uh, the way it uh, sort of highlights the human cost of religious intolerance is fascinating. So Taira Appa, thank you for joining us. And before I um, ask you about the novel and how uh, the, the process that you undertook, let me just uh, uh, mention a bit that uh, the recent cases of blasphemy uh, have been in the news. Unfortunately, blasphemy law is a sensitive subject. It is not covered by the mainstream media at all. Um, there was a, a recent incident a few months ago in Jaramala district of Punjab where Christian uh, houses and churches were uh, set on fire because there were blasphemy allegations against a few individuals. So this is something that is very common. Um, uh, neighborhoods are burned down. Uh, people are uh, killed in the name of blasphemy. And this is something that uh, people don't talk about. We've seen that when the former governor of uh, Punjab, Salman Tasi, talked about uh, reforms in the blasphemy law and stood up for the uh, Christian <clears throat> Asya Bibi who was falsely accused of blasphemy. He was killed by his own guard. Uh, there was uh, also Shabazz Bhatti who was a federal minister and he was killed uh, due to the same reason because he opposed the blasphemy law. So not, people who are even those who are opposed uh, to, to how blasphemy law is misused do not uh, talk about it. So it's a very sensitive topic, which is why this book is a very timely intervention. Um, the Jarawala incident, uh, sadly, nothing came out of the investigation. Just a few days ago, the Supreme Court of Pakistan uh, was given a report by, by the Punjab police uh, which had details about their investigation into the Jaramala incident, but the Supreme Court expressed its dissatisfaction with with the the way they had worked on on the investigation and on the report. There was uh, the Chief Justice said that it was a case of missing information. They had not properly done their work. So it goes to show that these cases of uh, extremism are not taken seriously. And the authorities try to, uh, you know, uh, ignore them. There are also sometimes uh, justifications uh, that are provided by by the powers that be, by the authorities, that you know, if someone 
someone uh, says something blasphemous, then there would be a reaction and it is justified. So this is a very complex um, issue, uh, which uh, Tahira Appa tackles so well in this uh, in this novel. And so I want to just uh, uh, talk about a little bit about the process. Uh, uh, you were telling me earlier that um, you wrote some parts of it many years ago, but then the recent Jaramala incident mm. sort of motivated you to uh, finish it and publish it. So tell us a bit about the process, how this book came about. Thank you so much, Elia, <clears throat> for having me on your uh, program. And uh, uh, let me begin by saying that um, I did start writing this novel in 1999 and I completed it in 2001. And at that point, uh, it was part of a larger work. Uh, but then uh, just uh, recently during the COVID uh, period, I uh, picked up the manuscript again. I had sort of put it aside all those years. And I picked it up and I thought, well, is, it, is this going to be a dated work? Uh, am I uh, am I really uh, you know is am I on track? Is it really time to bring this out? Things are okay in Pakistan. Things will be okay. Things are okay. Maybe the novel is just dated, and I should put it away. So, just as I was you know thinking about that, I I also realized that uh, maybe things have changed. Uh, but nevertheless, I need to put this novel in its proper form and uh, polish it and edit it so that whatever I have written, which very much uh, de was derived from the situation in Pakistan all those years ago um, and, and was taken, a lot of the incidents that I've used in the, in the novel are, are literally taken verbatim out of uh, news items about the blasphemy law, about intolerance, about the treatment of the minorities, especially the Christians in Pakistan. And these were taken directly from the Herald and from Newsline and from uh, Dawn. And so I thought, well, uh, you know, it will be a kind of a historical piece of a time that was uh, and so I put it together, I polished it and edited it. And then I uh, just during the COVID years, and then I thought, well, you know, let me see, uh, maybe. And of course, you know, I was getting news still from Pakistan. Things obviously had not uh, changed that much, it seemed. And uh, so I, I thought, well, let me um, send it out now that I've worked so hard on it. I sent it out and it was accepted by Speaking Tiger, Tiger Books in India, in Delhi. They loved the novel. And just as they were, and they, they started work on it. And then again, I was hit by this thought that, you know, I am bringing this out. The novel is going to be uh, out there in the, in the public sphere. And what if it's really dated? And just then, the incident you have just mentioned, the in, in the the Jarawala, Jarawala incident happened, and I thought sadly, and I thought also with a sense of satisfaction in the sense that I felt okay, the novel is not dated, but it was with sadness that I accepted that fact, and I uh, and I told my publisher, I said, you know that um, uh, I. I'm sorry, but this is what's happening still. And so in that sense, the novel has remained timeless. It's, it's the story that I tell is, and I say this with, with, you know, with terrible sorrow and uh, sadness, that the story is still the same and very little has changed. So anyway, that is, uh, you know, and the, and the novel begins with, my interest in what was going on in Pakistan. I've, uh, you know, although I've lived here in the United States for 53 years now, uh, I have my, my relationship with Pakistan has been one of a person who's almost an inhabitant of that country, even though I'm living here. 
because I used to visit every year. I used to take my children every year. In all these years, I've kept a very close connection. And so it wasn't as if, you know, I was just sitting there after 53 years and thinking back to a time that had happened or a long time ago and tried to tell a story about, a, you know, a, something filled with nostalgia. No, it was very much a story of the times that I had been part of in one way or another, either by association, by my uh, relatives, my parents who were living there, by reading about things that were happening, uh, by my very, very close, very, um, how should I say, um, you know, really uh, long and uh, kind of, um, what's the word, um, again, you know, I have to say deep relationship with that place, which is Pakistan, and especially Lahore, because I grew up there. And I've had connections with that city. And I visited it twice last year. I'm going back again this year. So the story is not one that comes out of nostalgia. It comes out of a need to tell the story of this this country, which I, which which is a beloved country. So the novel is as much an elegy, a kind of lament for the things that have gone awry in Pakistan and the things that have gone wrong and the terrible things that have happened. And at the same time, it is an ode of love. It is a kind of a, a poem in which I show how much I love that city. And Arif, the protagonist, becomes every man. He is Pakistan, and he is that part of Pakistan which tries and has tried in the past to fight this awful uh, change, these awful changes, I should say, that have happened over the years, the intolerance, the, uh, the, the treatment of the minorities, the terrible blasphemy law, all of the ways in which we have treated uh, people, this, the, the, the extremism, uh, all of that is, is, Arif represents the element in Pakistan which tries to fight against that. And so this is how the novel has evolved. Yeah. Thank you for, for uh, describing that, the whole process that you undertook. And I think um, it was very clear, uh, like while I was reading it, I've also grown up in Lahore. So uh, we could see that you were, you know, it was uh, your labor of love. A, a city where you have lived for a while and you knew that this is this city is facing this issue and it is something that needs to be written about and as you said that this the more things change the more they stay the same especially mm -hmm. when it comes to religious intolerance in Pakistan nothing seems to change and we're uh, we keep going back to square one even when there is some prog little progress in terms of uh, uh, people who are calling out uh, uh, this uh, wave of intolerance and extremism, uh, there comes another incident and it sort of sets, mm -hmm. uh, uh, gives us a reminder that uh, this issue is far from over and, and there are very little uh, sort of uh, very little resistance to it. Um, so I also think that, I mean, uh, uh, as someone who is in, from Lahore, I liked it. But another thing that another aspect that, you know, made me like it even more was that I have been covering uh, the issue of blasphemy law and religious intolerance. But a lot of times when you write about it, like as a news report or as a feature, people get to a bit, they're like, why this is so depressing and we don't have to, like, this is hard news. We don't have to read this. This is depressing stuff. But um, so it is very difficult to sort of, raise awareness about this issue, this sensitive issue, because people seem to think that it's just happening to working class people, to minorities, they're not affected by it. But mm -hmm. the way you have uh, sort of uh, combined the, the literary and the political to uh, sort of highlight the severity of this issue, I'm sure that it would make even people who are not usually interested in, you know, reading about extremism, about hard news, um, you know, yeah. at least uh, get interested in the subject and, you know, uh, uh, find ways to know more about it, to hopefully 
stand up to it the way they can because there are this uh, uh, group the tehreek-e labek pakistan which is currently uh, one of the leading i would say the, the leading um, outfit that uh, calls for violence against uh, so called blasphemers uh, mm-hmm. is doing well it is uh, you know it is given a free hand by the state uh, it also contested the recently held elections in pakistan uh, although it did not uh, win any seats right. but it was the fact that it was allowed to contest elections by the election commission of pakistan it says mm-hmm. a lot about how the authorities do not care if people who are you know uh, violent and who call for killings of blasphemers or religious minorities uh, are you know uh, part of the system so mm-hmm. this is all uh, an ongoing issue um so i'm curious to know when i first heard about it and the title itself reminded me of the one one particular case of of junaid hafiz who is um uh, was a professor in multan at the bahawalpur sakriya university and uh, he was accused of blasphemy by uh, a group at, at his university that was opposed to his liberal ideas and now he has been in jail for the last i think 9 more than 9 years he's on death row he was given uh, the death sentence in 2019 um and it was uh, he's a young person who is uh, you know paying the price for teaching critical thinking for holding alternative views and uh, his lawyer his previous lawyer was also killed in multan in 2014 so i i'm curious to know how real these characters are as you were saying earlier that uh mm-hmm. you read the news and most of these characters and these incidents are inspired by real life events so are are all the characters uh inspired by real people or how real the of the theme is i i people have asked me that because before i wrote the novel i i had the, i wrote these short stories and uh, people asked me if my if the characters in my short stories or the events in my short stories were based actually on real events or if they were autobiographical in any way and i used to say that everything that i that you read happened and none of it is true so in other words for a writer uh everything that that is there is part of the story uh for me especially in this case it comes from facts it comes from people i know it comes from myself i'm also a teacher i've been a teacher for uh, almost 40 years i think and i uh, it, uh, it it comes from my own experiences in the classroom i love teaching and i see great potential in uh, the ability of a teacher to affect change to uh, influence students and uh, so uh, so teaching is is uh, something that i'm very close to and um other characters are also always based on not based on derived from inspired by actual character actual people that i knew uh kamal's character in the novel is um was inspired by uh my uncle uh who uh introduced me me uh to um uh, sath and to uh gave me the age of uh, reason to read introduced me to um uh, tagore's gitanjali and so i mentioned those books and kamal is very much a uh, character who is reminiscent of my uncle he was also an activist uh, in pre partition india and so yes the stories uh, the characters and the stories are derived from real life this is not a work entirely of the imagination uh it's not you know a um, uh any kind, it's a, it's a realistic drama and uh, some of the characters are of course you know based on um uh, character people that i read about or maybe um heard about and others whom i knew personally my friends uh my relatives uh so um all of that you know becomes is woven into the fabric of a story of a novel uh, of a narrative and yes so in that sense um a lot of it 
comes from my own experiences in life. I've, you know, uh, been, uh, I've lived in this country for a long time and I've gone back to Pakistan very regularly. So, uh, and, and Lahore with all of its, uh, um, you know, history bears upon you when you visit that city and everything that happens there, it affects you. Uh, so yes, yes, uh, it is based on, on uh, real life incidents and actual people have inspired me. But at the same time, it is a, it's, it's a work of fiction. I will not call it a history book. I will not ask people to read this and check historical facts. Someone, uh, someone suggested that uh, there was a, uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in one particular part of the novel, in one scene, something was mentioned but actually hadn't happened yet. And so I said, you know what I do? In fact, I should have had a disclaimer at the beginning of the novel that there is a lot of his, the history in the novel. There are a lot of events that I recount. There are a lot of historical events, but I'm not using a timeline. I'm not using the actual timeline. I just want to use those incidents. I want to use those actual events as a backdrop to tell a story. And so, as I said, all of it is, is there, it happened, but none of it is true. So that it is a work of the imagination. It's a creative narrative, but it's based again on things that actually did happen. Yeah, no, definitely. I think it, uh, even if it may be, uh, a, it is a work of fiction, it is still an important sort of mm -hmm. documentation of, of a time when uh, religious intolerance was the norm, when uh, military dictatorship was ruining lives, people were standing up to it. So this is something that, that whether the themes are very much, uh, you know, something that you feel real. Yeah, real life yeah. also. So um, uh, you mentioned the education system in Pakistan. This is something that often comes up if a teacher tries to um, teach their uh, their students critical thinking or actual version of history. Uh, that is often considered transgression, mm -hmm. and they they are either fired or or they face consequences uh, mm -hmm. like uh, the blasphemy law cases that Junaid Hafiz and mm -hmm. others like him faced. Um, so you are uh, teaching in in the U.S. right now. Do you think the Western education system, uh, it also in the in light of what is uh, happening in Gaza right now, and there has been a uh, sort of a uh, clampdown on academic freedom in the U.S. also. So does this remind you of back home, how voices who are critical and who uh, try to, you know, hold alternative views are censored? Does it happen in the U.S. also? Well, at, at my university, I have not encountered anything like this in all the years that I've been teaching here in, in terms of, you know, interference in what goes on in the classroom. Until recently, and I won't say that that has been happening personally, to the um, to me or to my classroom or to my students in the classroom but it is going i mean the whole situation in uh, in the middle east is i mean in, G in gaza and and the war is affecting everybody all the institutions but i will say that there are institutions there are schools in this country where they are banning books and they have been banning books for example um, and recently, um, in one of the states, I forget now which one, uh, they banned To Kill a Mockingbird. So, I mean, the, the banning of books and the distortion of history, you know, banning history or books that deal with the Native Americans, uh, banning things that deal with uh, the African Americans, the history of... of uh, uh, slavery in this country. So yes, so they, that happens. There's distortion of history is common. It happens here. It happens in India. It happens in Pakistan. I talked to students. I, when I was writing the, the novel, I did a lot of research on the textbooks that were in use. Um, and yes, so in other words, to uh, go back to your question, uh, things in institutions, in educational institutions, there are, there are controls, there are 
you know, there is uh, the administration and there are people up there in the higher ups who will uh, uh, try to uh, interfere with free speech and uh, with free thought, I should say, also. And, and I think it's a universal problem. And this is a huge country. This is supposed to be a first world country. But I mean, look what's happening here. So um, there is, uh, so, so I mean, I, that's why I, when people tell me that Pakistan is on the brink of disaster and it's all going to be over soon, I, I, t I, I, I sort of shake my head and I will say, well, uh, the world is on the brink of disaster right now. Uh, but things move on and people, there are people who are going to um, prevent complete destruction of humanity. There are people like Arif. Uh, there, are, there are people in Pakistan and there are people here as well uh, who will rise up to the occasion. And so that is why I think Arif is almost a universal character, uh, a young man who whose life is ahead of him and who has hopes for a future of freedom, of academic freedom, personal freedom, political freedom, and the ability to uh, fight uh, intolerance. And so whether he is in Pakistan or whether you know he's here, I mean, it's the same thing. We're all looking at the same problem. Yeah, definitely. And um, like you mentioned, there are people who are standing up to this uh, injustice. They're challenging the status quo in Pakistan. There are many activists who are challenging extremism. Uh, they, they're doing so at a great personal risk, but they're out there on the ground. Um, so there is still hope yet. And uh, Religious extremism is something that people, young people, especially in Pakistan, now they're, uh, you know, they're not voting for extremist parties at least. So that's something yes. that was that's positive. So there's definitely hope, and uh, uh, but we also need uh, progressive uh, people in parliament who can uh, sort of introduce reforms to the blasphemy law, take this. Uh, Yes. Like that this is wrong you cannot take law into your own hands you cannot it's not yes. okay to kill a blasphemer we've often seen uh public uh, figures politicians justifying acts of violence saying that mm -hmm. there would be a reaction if people commit blasphemy but that should not be the case there should be a very clear line from the state from public figures from politicians that this kind of violence is not acceptable and they should not use it in their speeches either they should not use the religion card they should not accuse their opponents of of blasphemy just to uh, settle scores and score some round points. Uh, uh, and I think when there's a realization uh, uh, among our, our political class, among our politicians, that this kind of violence needs to stop. And we, uh, by stopping, by, you know, uh, stopping this hate speech that leads to it, you will be, you know, uh, changing this whole system, then, then I think we should see, we will definitely see some progress. Um, so let's hope for that. Um, I think in the end, I would like to ask you if, you know, people who would want to buy the novel, how can they do it, especially in Pakistan and abroad? Is it available yes. online? No, no, I'm so glad you've asked me that. So the novel has been reprinted in Pakistan by uh, a dear friend, uh, Ajmal Kamal of City uh, Press, Karachi. And so the books will be available. They are available already. Um, and uh, they're going to be available at the Lahore Literary Festival. Um, and uh, he especially has, he's having them sent over from uh, Karachi for the festival. So the books will be there. These, these have been uh, reprinted uh, by uh, City Press. And so uh, anybody who wants to read the book, you know, will have access to it, I'm happy to say. Yes. Yeah, definitely. It's, I highly recommend it. I enjoyed reading it. And it's a great yeah. piece of literature uh, that everyone, especially young Pakistanis, should read. Thank you so much, Dahirapa, for your time. We will end yeah. our video here.